From the Woodshed, a casual conversation with Chase Morrill and Ryan Eldridge of Kennebec Cabin Company, the team that inspired the hit show Maine Cabin Masters. From the Woodshed is brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp, trust the quality. By Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. By Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And by Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. Now, from the Woodshed Studios in Manchester, Maine, it's Chase and Ryan. From the Woodshed, I'm Chase Morrill. With me, as always, Ryan Eldridge. Hi, everybody. And Maggie Morrill. Hi. Hi, Mags. We're here about, to talk about all things Maine, all things Maine cabins, and all things Maine cabin related. And onions. And onions. <laughs> Today, our guest is Tyler Kidder. She is the program officer for the Onion Foundation, a great foundation that helps out you know a lot of programs across maine so we'll talk to her find out more information and you can find out more information about us at kennebeccabincompany.com maincabinmasters.com our facebook instagram youtube channel and our online store at shop.kennebeccabincompany.com and none of this would be possible without our sponsors nelma northeast lumber manufacturing association hero media network connecting small business with new customers Hammond Lumber Company, the official building materials supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company, and Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. You're way faster than your sister was last week. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let her take over my job. I know. She did a good job, though. She, Yes. She, you know. She hemmed in hard, but she came in and did it. Yes. Thank you, Ashley, for filling in for us last week. Yeah. Was Fletcher the only one that was positive, and he, and he didn't even... Was Fletcher he... was the only one who was positive, and... Didn't didn't affect the little bugger really. No, jeez, he was out. So he he's been skiing down our hill now. I saw the jump yet today or yesterday morning when I was there. That's yeah, pretty good. We've been watching a lot of the big air competition nice. for the Olympics. So we've got the burn pile down, and so he's packed it down, built a jump, built a starting ramp to get enough speed to go off that. I like it. He's working on his one eighty, and yeah, he just goes out there and rips it, it up. Him and his cousin are in like a one eighty contest. Yeah, I haven't seen on social media both. Doing pretty well. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be up. The, they're gonna be skiing this weekend together. So nice. watch out. Look out. Watch wherever out. they're going. Yeah, Saddleback or Sugarloaf. I think they're gonna be at Sugarloaf. Nice. Yeah, ripping it up. Yeah, that's fun. What else is going on? You guys had a week off. We missed you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ski racing. Ski racing. Ski racing. It's been a great week to be skiing. Uh, it was okay. What was it like up there? Soft, really soft. Yeah, it's gross. That's the thing that gets me. You gotta remember, like, it has to be, for it to be beautiful at Sugarloaf, it's gotta be like fifty here usually, or inversion. No, it was like thirties up there. No wind, sunny. That's pretty nice. I mean, no, it was, it was really nice. And again, it was fresh snow. The turn, the, you know, you didn't hear any scraping when they were making their turns around the gates. I'd and rather stuff. have that than it be forty degrees. Poor Michaela didn't make her gate. You see that? I did see that. Oh, sad. Yeah. You guys been watching Olympics? Oh yes, so cool. Yeah, some of the stuff they do is just it blows my mind. Complete all, all of it. I, what's your favorite thing to watch? I think it's the ski jumping itself. The old school, just launching yourself off that huge. That's pretty cool. You know that huge ramp and just sailing through the air. They said they go about a hundred yards. Yeah. I mean, did you in see the, the half pipe? The, the, like the, <laughs> yeah. the 22 feet? I definitely like the Winter Olympics a lot more than Summer Olympics, personally. For sure. It's a lot more my style. Yeah. And, that, and like the short track racing when they're all just flying around and like, it's almost like roller derby. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, and the luge, bobsled, skeleton, it's all it's all fun to watch. Yeah, good times. So I've, um, I've got a funny story for you. I'm driving around right now and I'm coming on my 100,000 mark. And my warranty ends. So I'm up to like, it's been the last two days have been crazy because we started that house and I've been running around. We're trying to finish up Steve's house. They need something. Like typical Ryan, I should have left a trailer there and then it snowed. Sure. It's just winter. Nothing's easy. Yeah. So I'm watching the odometer go up and I'm like, Ashley, we might get to a point I have to drive to O'Connor's and park in the yard, you know, <laughs> because 100,000 miles after that is <laughs> SOL. So what do you just bring it in there and be like, okay. Go over the whole thing. Go over the whole thing. Yeah. Nice. Obviously, I have to pay for some. Right, 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 right. Stuff. No, that's that's smart. And when you get your new truck, you'll get diagnostic reports <laughs> in your email. Like one of my back right tires is fifty four for some reason, and then emissions was messed up. And yeah. technology. Yeah, we've had a couple of big snowstorms, and what a difference that makes! It's just it's so beautiful. It isn't so much more fun. Snowmobilers are 
piling into the woodshed. Oh, no, it's not. All you can hear is all through West Guide. Like, <laughs> rah, rah, rah. like everywhere, all night long. And it's been so cold in the past. You know the lakes are frozen. So, you know, even with the snow, it's... Winter's here. Winter's here. And it's fun. We've got some uh, good projects. I feel like we got Jan- uh, January thaw now because we didn't get a January thaw. No, it's true. And he did see his shadow. So we're going we're gonna to have winter for a while. Right. And the film crew is coming next week. Film crew will be back next week. Yep. Yep. So it's kind of, we've been getting a little slack from them because we, you know, we were at, it's like, we need some time off for winter. We need to get caught up on our own stuff, take care of friends and family. Well, I, you know, we went to look at a couple of projects that, you know, we thought we might do to, one was the Y camp, which were near and dear to us. And we actually found two projects we could start this time of year. Right. And we I, never do. Right. And you guys love the show so much that they want, like, <laughs> we're going to do it. We'll film you. So it's kind of weird. We fought for all this time off, and here, here we are <laughs> starting to film again. Yeah, re- remind us of that in uh, September, October. Oh, I know. I'm Ash. Like, you need to write yourself a letter, and I, I am. <laughs> we write ourselves a letter. The last couple of years, we got our Christmas decorations open, and we wrote ourselves letters. Did you? Do you really do it? Because we don't. We, <laughs> Christmas just isn't our thing. And I, the last. That's kind of weird. Uh, it's funny. Family, I love you. Don't get mad. But two years ago, we opened up and it said, if you guys are reading this at Christmas, you're a bunch of dumbasses. Remember how, you know what it is? Because it was so busy and busy, busy. And everyone, there's so much going on. Everyone wants your attention. You got time. That Christmas, we're done work for a while. We get our break. And then it's just like the, the, the activities, the holidays, and like the running oh, yeah. around just wasn't relaxing for us. So we said, you need to be gone. Can you do that on your iPhone? Can you send texts oh, that you'll get in a year? No, you got reminders. No. Reminders and stuff. But you can set it for a year? You can just, there's a website oh, yeah. and you can do it. Yeah, reminders all I actually place. got an email from myself like a couple of weeks ago. Really? Yeah, it was weird. Be like, hey, spring's coming. Make sure you uh, take your snow tires off your car or something. Yeah, stuff like that. Huh. I'll have to check it out. Please don't yeah. start doing that. I'm going to. Please yes, don't. it's so awesome. It <laughs> really is. do that. Like, okay. Ryan, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna warm up. The days are gonna get longer. You're gonna come, you know, you're gonna come out of this dark little hole. Like it's gonna be great. Well, Ryan, go away for January. So, yeah. Maggie, as you get older, you can't remember stuff as much. And my eyesight's going. I'm like, yes. Don't, don't need to remind me. My remember eyesight's stuff. already gone. You got me there. Okay. Yeah. Make me feel like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyways, what's going on over there, Jen? Anything? Just hanging out. You were a good Maggie last week. Did I do all right? Yeah. Yeah. I know of all the people to miss. I know. I know. He, I know. He wanted to talk to Ashley more about like how we make the TV because he was so fascinated about how we do it. Like, oh, how many cameramen you got? Like, yeah. You know, it's like, and I just want to hear about like what he did. Yeah. And uh, it was pretty cool. But they invited us down. We need to go down sometime and check it out. Yeah, sounds great. Oh, yeah. I'll go check it out. I felt like I was kind of cool because I get this old house magazine. I've been getting it for like five, six years. So right, 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 right. I knew all the ins and outs and yeah. they do a lot of cool stuff. Well, then I'll just have to tune in and watch it. You're going to have to. <laughs> and the funny well, the funny thing was is, you know, Ash, you know Ashley, she she doesn't like curveballs. She fought. I oh, know I'm not prepared. I've never seen that. And then she I, has. Oh, I hear Isadora talking. Oh, yeah, might you might you might get. I used to watch it all the time. And then like I hear him talking about like we, we grew up with PBS. Like, oh, you guys yeah. have a TV. Yeah. She watched it all the time. Oh, yeah. And then I put, you know, a reminder of your dad. Then she got all sad and <laughs> right into it, though. But she did a good job. Perfect, perfect, perfect. She said she's worried she did too good of a job, and then we're gonna make her do it again. <laughs> hey, now that we know we have a replacement, I loved it. So yes, <laughs> one more thing before we go. Oh my yes, god, yes, gonna be the longest. Uh, yeah. Which just SOS him. It's fun. Yesterday, uh, she asked me. I was talking to Chase, walking in the house. She said, tell my brother I need. He needs to name three of these colors. He just didn't gonna be. Yeah, we'll give her to about the one she gives us the paint colors normally, and she just started <laughs> laughing and walked off. Okay, <laughs> Ashley, it all goes. What goes That's around right. comes exactly, around. Exactly, exactly. But we will be right back with another great video from Saddleback. Some more skiing. Yeah, go with the skiing theme, of the Olympics, and after that, we'll be back with um, our new guest, Tyler Kidder. Welcome back to the largest independent ski resort in the East. We're back. <laughs> We're Saddleback Mountain in beautiful Rangeley, Maine. Where the views are epic and the terrain is everything you could hope for. We've got over 600 acres of trails for all levels. From little bunny hills to the steep shoots of our hand-cut glades. 
Because around here, independent doesn't mean small. It means our entire focus is on the needs of our Saddleback family and on improvements like our brand new Rangely high-speed quad. It's just one way we're getting more people to the top faster. Plus, we've invested over three million into snowmaking, which now covers 85% of our trails. Not to mention a fleet of eco-friendly groomers ready to lay down wall-to-wall -wall carpets of corduroy. When you need a break from skiing, our base lodge has drinks and bites to make your mouth water. Because the truth is, we're family up here. Saddleback! Saddleback's more than a mouth. It's a community. And for those young and old, beginners or pros, We've got greens to glide, blues to cruise, and black diamonds to conquer. Plus the youngest lift fleet in the east, a new base lodge, new HVAC, new condos, green groomers, and a new moving carpet so we can get the next generation just as excited as we are. So come play at the largest independent ski resort in the east. Welcome back to Saddleback. And we are back with Tyler Kidder, the program officer for the Onion Foundation. Thanks for joining us, Tyler. Thanks for having me. Hi, Tyler. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I wish I was in the studio with you all, but this will have to do beaming in from my home in Winthrop. Well, I was going to say, I wanted to ask where you're beaming in from because it looks like a great spot. It, even yeah. Though um, <laughs> oh, sorry. You say. What oh, were you gonna... um, even though you're away from us, we all we still do our um, standard um, coffee, water, or beer during our segment. It's virtual, so what would you go with? It? Yes, I I came prepared. I knew you did. Um... I knew you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I recently started making kombucha again, so oh. I mix some of my kombucha with some hard seltzer. So that's what I'm enjoying on my end of the internet today. Kombucha and hard seltzer, fantastic. Well, I will be having a uh, Kushnock Coles. Nice local beer, and yeah. I'm gonna go with my Ruby Red fake drinky. Good, <laughs> good for calories things. I, I Beautiful. Love good stuff. We were out in, does it Seattle that had the kombucha? Oh place? yes, yes. I had like 45 different types, it was so amazing. I kept finding myself going to a lap around, getting more, lap around and getting more. <laughs> So yeah, again, cheers and thanks for joining us. So let's start out by just, you know, what is the uh, the Onion Foundation and yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Onion Foundation is a family foundation. We're based here in Maine and our founders are from Maine. Um, they started the foundation a few years ago with interests in the arts and the environment. And so now we are a team of three staff and um, our two original founders as well are also part of our team. And um, yeah, we were really interested in connecting Mainers with nature and connecting Mainers with art. And so we make hundreds of small, medium-sized grants a year to Maine-based nonprofits who are doing interesting and important work um, in their own communities. So we make grants all over the state. So I just got to get this out of the way. I've been thinking about it since Jen told me about you a little bit and the Onion Foundation. Now, uh, the founders, from an onion magnet family, like great farmers, had a great history, made all kinds of money that, or is it about layers or like, what's the correlation here? That's a great question. And I, um, so the founder's last name is onion. Okay. So, oh, so obvious, but, <laughs> but it's, they're, you know, have English heritage yeah. and were probably the guess is they were onion farmers oh, back cool. in England and that other members of their extended family may have been, you know, motivated to change their last name when they emigrated, but the onions held on to it. I love the confidence. <laughs> <laughs> we can move There's on There's like now. infinite confusion with like the onion, the publication. Right. And oh, right. Yeah, 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 and sure. Yeah. I have a Google search alert and it always is bringing up recipes. <laughs> like, <laughs> instead of things that onions have been featured doing it, or uh, press releases from our grants, it brings up recipes. <laughs> so, you know, you guys just had to, you've been given grants to um, different, you know, individuals and groups across Maine. 
Um, and that's been going on for a few years now. How do you guys pick those people? Yeah, we, I mean, there are, so Maine is rich of nonprofits. There are, you know, hundreds of nonprofit organizations that are big and little and do all different things. And um, so we invite those who are doing work in our focus areas to put in applications. And then we have a, we have a set of priorities that we evaluate them against and we kind of have a scoring and internal evaluation process. Um, we actually have a really good website. And one of the things that's generally, you know, can often be true in philanthropy is there's not a lot of transparency about how those decisions are made and who gets the money and who doesn't get the money. And we're really interested in telling the story of how you can get money from us and why we feel like the work you're doing is worthy of support. And I mean, of course, lots of people are doing work that's just not in our issue area. So it, um, there are tons of other organizations that are doing important work as well, but we have a, a pretty rigorous internal review process. Um, and we have a, an online application form that folks can download in advance and then lots of info on our website so they can kind of see if what they're doing is a good fit. How long does the process usually take from beginning to end? Yeah, so right now we're, uh, our spring cycle is open. We have two open cycles each year, spring and fall. So it means we're accepting applications through um, Wednesday, March 9th. And then we spend three to four weeks with our heads down, reading all the applications, meeting as a team, doing due diligence, asking additional questions if we have any. And then we try and turn those um, those decisions around by middle of April. So um, that's another thing. If you know, a lot of nonprofits are familiar with big bureaucratic grant processes that take months and months to yeah. get your you know get your decision back, and we have like essentially a four week turnaround. We're kind of the same. I guess we're kind of a nonprofit too, right? We do the same thing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, and, we don't make any money. And in, in that sense only. <laughs> and, we're, and we're always doing going through applications, yeah. right? About the same well, time. Yeah. Well, that's what was I was thinking. About, you know, it must be really hard because you get all these great applications, and you know, you want to help everybody do it, but it's just. Yes. Do you? I I fall in love with camps, you know, and it's hard when you know, when you know you know deep down you can't pick that camp, but I love it and like. I'll try to like yes. put you know persuade I, Chase over here. <laughs> <laughs> I empathize with that. I like to call myself like an optimistic generalist. So yeah. everything I see, I'm like, <laughs> I see the potential in it. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my god. And my team's always like, cool it, kidder, like <laughs> focus. <laughs> and I'm like, but look at this. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, come, coming into something with uh, you know non-binding thoughts and you know is hard. You know, like, yeah, for sure. Because, like, yeah, they there's so much potential with all of them. There's so many ways to help out, but it's like, okay, you gotta, yeah, stay focused and yeah, I've gotta make choices. Work yeah. within. And your... one of my favorite lines, yeah, and one of my favorite lines is like, "Me saying no to you is not an assessment of your value in this world. <laughs> it's an assessment of your fit against our priorities, yeah. you know, and your methodology, your approach." So I, cause I hate, I hate saying no to people. We all do. We, <laughs> yes. we do this work because we love Maine and we love people. And so yeah. we all have our own way of saying that essentially. Well, we, we got lucky. So we, we have so many applications. We don't have to say no, you know, cause people are always asking us like, how do you know? Like we don't just have the time or resource to tell them. But that being said, there's been times when we've called someone after three years and said, we'll pick your cabin. And they like, they, but they like, oh, we, we forgot about they put it in, you know. We forgot all about that. It's, it's pretty amazing, you know. After two or three years, when you call somebody, and they still haven't done the I work. Bet. And there's been a couple times where I've called somebody and they already did the work, and they was like, oh, right, right, like, right, oh, right, just, right. I'm just kidding. Oh, Wrong number. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, can you tell us about some of the projects that you guys have been working with recently? Yeah, I mean, we have. So I think we're funding some like. 150 to 175 unique organizations wow. and they're doing a lot of different things. So my issue area is environment. I have a colleague, Nat May, who works in the arts. Um, and so our jobs is to kind of, you know, be landscape experts in our different issue areas. And um, we do grant, we make grants around climate and um, sort of stewardship. So lots of trail stuff. Also, um, outdoor recreation and getting people outside. So signage and programs that maybe teach kids to mountain bike or 
build out a small gear library so that a small community can access snowshoes and backpacks. And so it's really like breaking down barriers to allow people to connect to nature. And then we also fund um, climate change work and research and um, lots of different things. And then in the arts, we have, you know, a real focus on engagement and presentation. So really interested in, again, like connecting people to the arts. Um, so looking for sort of like interesting um, exhibitions or engagement elements that include maybe education. So we're less likely to fund something that's static and more likely to fund something that's got a real like public engagement element to it. Um, and uh, and we, we fund across all different kinds of arts disciplines as well. So music and, you know, visual arts and graphic arts and Nat's going to be embarrassed when he listens to me talk about the arts later. <laughs> He's going to be like, Tyler, what were you saying? <laughs> so don't call me, call Nat if you need help with the arts. <laughs> now you, you guys um, are involved with a, something to do at Saddleback, am I correct? Yeah, so uh, the awesome. family, our founders, yeah. um, are they also do personal giving outside yeah. of our, our um, issue areas. But yeah, they recently did that affordable housing um, oh. sort of match grant yeah. in Rangeley up on the mountain. And, you know, they're originally from Farmington. And so Franklin County and the Western Maine is very close to their hearts and paying a lot of attention. And through the foundation, we've made a couple of like mountain bike trail grants. Oh, awesome. And we also fund um, both Rangeley, uh, Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust, which is the big yeah. land trust there that does really important land and water and sky stuff. They're really working hard on the dark sky stuff. Um, and we also fund Rangeley Friends of the Arts. So we're in Rangeley in a couple of ways. That, that's, that's really groundbreaking on the East Coast, you know, because we all lived out West and lived at ski areas and the one thing I remembered is it was always employee housing. And that was the big thing. Like someone from Maine could go out there and get yes. affordable housing. And you're know, constantly seeing here how this, these areas are struggling in Maine. And now they're competing with how yeah. popular our state is. And, all, you know, so it, that's amazing and a perfect timing. Yeah. And so important to make the three season, four season yeah. reality, right? Like, you know, make sure there's places for people to work and live year round so that they can actually have a family there and you know maybe graduate from being a ski bum to being like a human who lives in range like <laughs> see mom it wasn't my fault for so long <laughs> we need you no know, we need we need everybody right we need the ski bums and we need the people who live and right. send their kids to school in rangeley so uh we need all of those people yeah, the energy up there is amazing. You know, we've been involved with Saddleback the last couple of years, and it's Arcteris, what they're doing. Like, it's just pretty neat to see how that place has come alive in just a short time. And It's so exciting. Yeah. Yes. And, and same with Millinocket. Yeah. Like, right, right, right. What, you know, what a hard thing. And then you go there, and it's just, it just feels really, like, exciting and full of potential now, and things are kind of sparking. Yeah. But along, you know, along with popularity and more usage, there's also a lot of issues and, you know, regulation and, you know, stewardship, like you said, talked about, that comes along with it just because, you know, it's got to be available. It's got to it's got to stay viable as it becomes more and more used and, you know, available. more people, more. Yeah, impact. more. Yeah. More availability means more access and issues like it's a double edged sword, really. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I was just listening to the news, like up in Moosehead, you know, Greenville area. I saw there, that. Like, trying to figure out, you know, there there's this big development, which is so exciting and really scary, right? Like we want it and we want it done really carefully. And it's so important to balance all of the needs for housing and business development along with our natural assets, which is why people want to live there. <laughs> you know, so it's just... <laughs> like really hard to to make everybody happy in this and and to make it make financial sense um so yeah maine has its its work cut out for it in the next couple of years especially as we're absorbing covid mm -hmm. refugees and climate refugees right like it's just it's we're gonna we're gonna be a destination forever even more so than we already have been absolutely yeah climate change too is like it, it's hard to tell like it's getting more and more I don't. I kind of think some people are gonna that moved here in the COVID thing. Another winter like that, they might stop moving out. It, as this last one, it might make me move. 
<laughs> you know, this seems to be. I, <laughs> Here we go again. I always like. <laughs> like I forget winter to winter. Like I remember last winter, it, we didn't have a lot of snow. And then this winter we have like a lot of snow and also ice and slush and yeah. it's just kind of terrible. And I was like, is this the way winter usually is? I can't remember. I don't think we know. I, well, I think that's it. There's no set recipe for winter and that's what makes it fun and also frustrating. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, yes. My, so um, Ryan and I were chatting before you came on, but this place that I'm in is a camp turned into a year round home completely renovated by my partner lon and who is a a physician assistant by day and mm -hmm. a tinkerer ui diy or nice. <laughs> by night we maintain our mile long camp road <laughs> and oh, yeah. it's a plane. especially last oh, year oh my god yeah the mud we last started year. maintaining it ourselves last year and i was like this isn't so bad i got the tractor <laughs> you know got the, the novelty board. wears off really quick i'm like oh my god what have we done what have we done <laughs> yeah yeah it's like the ice you're like okay keep it sanded and now it's like, where do I put all this snow? Oh god! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Chase has a long road. He was his sponsor for it. I do. So we we know your pain, and like, it's fun after a while. And like, you want to be that back to the earth there and homestead, and but yeah. it, it's a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. I, I I learned very quickly after owning a tractor and changing the implements in the winter. Like, finally, it just clicked. That's why farmers have like five tractors because they never have to change <laughs> yes. their their implements. Yes. You know, like if you try to do that in the winter, it's like, oh my god. Yeah. I know you're going to break your fingers off. Just got to keep learning. <laughs> now, do, does the Onion Foundation have a home base? We have an office in Auburn. Okay. Um, and we're there sometimes. And uh, we live mostly in Central Maine, and then a couple of us live in the Portland area. So we used to go to the office a little bit more frequently. Right, um, right, right. But now we mostly work from home. And one of the things we love is like going to our grantees events, you know, they'll host, they'll have performances in the arts or, um, you know, trail walks and uh, nature based education events and series that we like to go to. And hopefully we're, you know, we dipped our toe back into that kind of site visit land last year, um, focused mostly on the down east. And then I hope we'll be able to do that even more this year. But of course, we really missed out in 2020 where we were all just right. trying to keep our distance. Now, do you tend to focus on certain areas? Like, you know, we, we try and be more efficient and group our cabins so that, you know, makes geographically, it geographically. Right? Do you also kind of do that just to help? With with site visits, yes. Like when we're planning a trip, you know, we'll mm -hmm. kind of cluster five that Clusters. seem both like we need to see them and they're near each other. And then our geographic focus in grant making is, is really just rural and remote. Um, we just are recognizing that there is more money available in Southern Maine and coastal Maine and yep. less money in general available inland. And so when we, one of our criteria is sort of like, is it rural and remote? Like, is it serving a community that isn't served by something else like this? Um, and we, we take that into consideration and so you know, there's a lot of good work coming out of Portland and some of it is just less competitive because it feels like duplication of other work or like there's already so many cool programs that people can tap into. We don't need to pile on. Yep. We're going to focus on Rangeley <laughs> you know? or Skowhegan. I was just on the phone yesterday with Skowhegan Outdoors who are doing really cool, you know, hikes and snowshoes and just trying to get regular folks outside in the winter and in the summer. Nice. I believe they have a dream about Whitewater Park, like they have out west. That would be awesome. Yes. Oh, they have yeah. a dream. Yeah, that's, that's more a, than that's more than a dream. It's, it's start. It's a, yeah. It's a master plan. It's happening. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's yes. awesome. Maine is Run really. Run a river. Awesome. It's gonna be awesome. Maine is so awesome right now. Just so happy. There's just so much energy here. It's so awesome. It's like, I go I go out I go out around here and I just look around and like all these younger people that are here and all these hip new places are popping up. Like it's really a great place to be and really proud to be a part of it. And I never thought yes. I'd because I never thought I would see it happen. To be honest with you, you know, <laughs> we well, we you know we all well, grew up. There's... We're at, we're leaving. Yeah. We're not coming back. Yeah, there's still work to be done, but oh, yeah. I do feel like our like our tourism department is kind of focused on the right ways now. Like they're really thinking about assets. Like what does Maine already have, and and how can we keep it special, right? Rather than like making Maine look like every other tourist destination and. 
Um, and, and they're focusing more on rural and remote, like destination recreation is what they call it, you know, getting people up to Eustis and getting people up to the rim so that they can enjoy our great, you know, Northern woods and yeah. all that it has to offer. But we do need some like nicer hotels up there. <laughs> if you haven't got useless in Eustis, you haven't lived. <laughs> I spent a lot of time <laughs> stratton Houston. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> now, do you guys have a, like, are you focused on more, like, local native people or, like, tourists coming in or kind of a mix of both? There's no one generic, you know, specific we area? Are, we, we are mostly interested in serving people who live in Maine. Yep. So... Like a lot of times, you know, nature-based education is a great example. There's so many cool programs, like there's the Chowankis and the 4-H's and the Scudics, and they all have um, summer camps that cost money. And so those attract a ton of out-of-state people. And we often make grants to those organizations, not to support their summer camps, but to support their year-round school programming, yep. where they're partnering with local schools that, you know, where main kids are going and they're sparking that love of their backyards and they're giving kids a, a new way of looking at home or you know a day trip or an overnight trip a lot of those are residential centers too so you know like you maybe have maybe you remember in sixth grade right. you like went and spent a week at 4-h yeah. um and so we try to tailor it so that it really is serving mainers and we recognize that it, other people might benefit as well but that's our target and i think an important piece of that is we, i've actually I still say Mainers, but I'm moving away to saying the people of Maine because we have our whole Wabanaki and indigenous friends and they, you know, they were here first. Um, and so we're actually doing a lot of work to try and support food sovereignty, um, indigenous art, um, some land back land access work as well. Nice. Yeah. Uh, are there any hotbed issues for the environment that you guys are working on or focused on? Oh Lord! I, I know, there, been... what is happening with the PFAS right yeah, now? Yeah, that's, that's what I was. I wanted to know your stance on that. You know, sometimes we don't want to yeah, talk about we, things like that, but it's such a it's 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 happening and it has to be addressed. And it's happening. Yeah, we aren't we aren't really in a position to like respond in an emergency like this, especially well. But we are. You know, I was actually just emailing with um, my contacts at. MAFCA, Maine Organic mm -hmm. Farmers and Gardeners, and Maine Farmland Trust, and just asking them, like, organizationally, how are they planning to kind of staff up or get ready to really fight what is going to be a long and litigious battle to get PFAS recognized, the land remediated, and farmers compensated, and then the rest of us mm -hmm. tested or made safe. Um, and it's it's going to be a mess. Um, so that's a hotbed thing. It's always a hotbed thing. And for people that I don't think, know, you know, that's the forever yes. chemicals that have been in the sludge that, you know, these farmers didn't know what they unwillingly knew what they were, you know, causing this damage. But they took the sludge and put it on their fields. And now 20, 30, you know, decades later, it's starting to come back and, you know, not be so good for us. You know, we got some other things. And it's, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. You know, we, we, we got a little fight with us on Cobbacy Lake about the milfoil invasive species, and it's scary as heck, and I feel like it's kept me up a little bit at night, but then I think about all the people in this area that just love it, and, you know, it, it's, don't mess with Maine. You know, Maine is, <laughs> love it, we're, we're proud of it, you know, and if we don't have a lot of money, we have time, you know, and I, and I think all these issues, you know, we got the right team yeah. in the right place to, to fight it on. I'm glad you brought up invasive species because that's we actually make a lot of grant to freshwater organizations mm -hmm. like Friends of Cobbacy, yep. Cobbacy Water District, um, Lakes Environmental Association in the Lakes Region in Bridgeton. And um, yeah, I mean, we we've been, you know, paying attention and there are a bunch of outbreaks yeah. of or infestations. I guess they aren't outbreaks. I've got like virus on the mind. <laughs> We're like but, living um, a sci-fi novel, pandemics and like, outbreaks. <laughs> yeah, like Androscoggin and Cobbacy. And it's it's really, um, I think, you know, we're lucky in Maine that we we are organized to deal with this stuff in a lot of places. Independent, there yeah. are some parts of the state that are less organized and don't really have the resources. But even those parts, um, I feel like, People who have resources are like driving up to help with the invasive species removal and and um, IPP invasive plant paddlers, right? So you get your volunteers out there paddling in their kayaks to 
to spot the plants and to remove them and get them tested. And that is going to be also the challenge of our lifetimes uh, um, in this area. Yeah. And the biggest thing is educate people. And if you like to enjoy it, then you need to put time and just help it, keep it that way. Yeah. And so, Join your lake association. If there's a lake yeah. that you put your boat in, whether you own property or not, if you fish there, Google it and give money to that lake association because those people are on the front lines and are protecting your quality of experience for sure. Exciting times, but scary times too. We got this. Yeah, I guess everybody's every time has its scariness. You know, this is ours. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. With we'll a smile on our face. Yes, absolutely. All right. So I think Maggie has a few fan questions for you that we put together. I do. All right. These are always great. Don't be nervous. Don't be scared. <laughs> I'm not scared <laughs> of the questions or Maggie. <laughs> I'm scared of Maggie. <laughs> I'm just sad I can't see Maggie, but I know that uh, she's there. Yeah, we'll turn the I'm camera here. real fast. Nope. Yeah, Maggie. Oh, nope. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm, <laughs> not even, I'm not even going to try. No. You're Anyways. not supposed to touch that. <laughs> Maggie, if you can slide over here with us. Come on over. Come on. Listen. I don't want to come I know, over. We know you don't want to. <laughs> you can use my microphone. I'll sit in the middle. I'm sorry, Maggie. I'm sorry to make you do this. Hi. Hello. I can see you. I think this but is now great. My question Put a <laughs> face to the voice. I'll just, I'm, I'll be gone this in a second. Is, this is what Maynas do. We adapt. See? We you need to stop. <laughs> You're on my board. <laughs> there we go. All right. Jen's going to kill you. All right. Are you ready? Yes. All right. This question is from Jackie Dore. What's the coolest project you've worked on? This is a hard Jackie, one. that is hard. Didn't, I, didn't you hear me say we give out hundreds of grants a year? <laughs> um, how, about most how about most interesting? Most interesting. Well, I'll tell you, there's one that's coming up that has been um, on our plates for a long time, which is we helped to fund a commissioned symphony to uh, express or explore global warming. And it was supposed to debut at the Maine Science Festival in bum, 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 March of 2020. And so, of uh, course, it didn't happen. Yeah. Better late than but never. it is being debuted this year. Um, and so we are going to go up to Orono and witness the performance of The Warming Seas, which is uh, a piece commissioned to explore climate change. So That's Google cool. it. It's yeah. very cool. All right. Next question. This one is from Marina Kelly. What are some of the criteria you use when deciding which projects to help with? Great question. We've talked a little bit about like geography, like we're interested in moving money around the state, so rural and remote. Um, I think we're also very interested in access. And so if you're doing something that gives Mainers an opportunity that they wouldn't otherwise have in the areas of like connecting to the outdoors, connecting to nature, connecting to art, we wanna know about it. We're really interested in getting new and non-traditional people to have welcoming, inclusive, enriching experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have because we really believe that connection to nature and connection to art is like the heart of a thriving community and they're really important values for Maine. Now, that how much follow up do you guys have in the whole process? Because I mean, it's you know, it's one thing to de develop this to you know, hand out the funds and stuff, but you also have to have you know some sort of system in place. You know, make sure it's going forward. You know, helping it move forward, progress yeah. properly. Like, do you guys are you also part of that as well? Like, it gets. Yes, we. <laughs> I am a one woman environmental team, uh, <laughs> so yes. Um, I read and assess the grant applications and coach people before yeah. they put them in. And then I sometimes read their organizational newsletters as they go throughout the year. I try and pay attention to their social media, see how things are going, see how things are being promoted, see how things are being attended. And then they are required to submit a progress report yep. where they can tell yep. us some numbers and some stories and, and be like, it usually, I mean, it's, it's grant writing, right? And so people say they, they have high hopes and a lot of times they're like, wow, that did not go the way <laughs> right, I thought right. it was going to go. 
but we learned something. And so that's usually what the progress reports say. It's like, we thought X number of humans were gonna come and do this thing, but actually Y number came and they actually did a different kind of thing. And so next year we're gonna do this other thing. And it's like, you know, that's how it goes. And so can people apply, you know, for a grant and then apply again as things kind of adapt and change? It's not a one yeah, time. So it's one, it's, it's one per year, but okay. you can apply year after year. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I have one last question. This one Great. is from Lori Gibson. Can you give some examples of projects related to providing resources to adapt to a changing climate? Good question. Yes. Um, so a lot of the nature-based education program, thank you for coming on camera, Maggie. I really appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> I think we'll have to change this in the future. Yes. Um, a lot of the nature-based education that we fund is includes climate. So maybe um, you know students from an elementary school are visiting a land trust. They're meeting with the scientist, and the scientist is giving them a lesson on X, Y, Z. And a lot of that includes climate. Um, we also uh, have funded um, both Mafka and Wolf's Neck Center for the for Ag and the Environment last year for soil work. Um, so it's really the looking at the connection between healthy soils and climate and carbon sequestration in soils and how do we build soils over the year to avoid depletion of nutrients and really make sure that our ag and farmland is as productive as it can be which helps us produce more food which means we need to import less food so there's like a lot of climatey stuff um oh we lost yeah we lost just volume I didn't touch oh, and back. Yeah, oh, perfect. yeah, you're back. <laughs> that was just, I think actually I pushed a button. Sorry. That was a lesson in lip reading. What did she say, Chase? <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we fund some climate research, like Bigelow Laboratories in Booth Bay does a lot of really cool research, and they're pretty involved with the community. And their whole thing is like change and climate change. That is their research focus. So those are just some examples of of climate work that we've been funding. Man, you guys cover a broad area. You must you got to be an expert in a little bit like Dixie. Yeah. Expert on a little bit of everything. <laughs> Something about nothing. Yeah. That's, the, that's the, the optimistic generalist. Yeah. 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 Dixie knows, knows just, just enough, enough to be dangerous. Get, get in conversation <laughs> with anybody about anything. Crafting, knitting, sailing, just and he knows one term. It's the best. I'm like, yeah. how does he know that? Getting the sailing, I love oh, yeah. that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, we're gonna have to do a follow up with you then. You know, six months or something. See how, what you've, all this good work you've been up to. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, I would. So you know, I live on a lake. I watch your all's show a lot. Yeah. And we have, you know, I'm I'm always interested in how some of the like climate change stuff and the water quality stuff really shows up for you as like practitioners, you know, you're dealing with the, you know, oh my gosh, my brain just went out of my ear, but um, what is the- Well, well you, you would shoreland love- Shoreland zoning. Yes. Oh my God, so, shoreland zoning, I got there. <laughs> we have become shoreland zoning experts, so to speak, um, not by choice. <laughs> and I've become somewhat of a planning board expert i guess you, uh, not by choice you know it's just happened yes. um we've done so you probably have every yeah, oh speed every dial. town ceo on speed dial yep. yeah we've done several i mean i've done dozens of pbrs now it's a permit by rule and you know even last night i was at a planning board meeting in winthrop and i just learned you learn something every meeting you know it's amazing like to pay attention oh my and my husband was supposed to be at that meeting but nobody it? told him to go <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, maybe that's why I got out to, got out so early. It only lasted an hour, so I tell him I said yeah. thank you. He's yeah, he's doing a business out of a, a warehouse. Oh, um, yeah. It's called Main Float. He's building motorized. Oh, I saw that. Yep. Table. Cool. And he just needed a, a use permit for that. Conditional use. Yeah. Um, our friend owns the warehouse where he's doing production on Old Lewiston Road. So. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, our CEO was texting us like, where are you guys? And we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody told us we needed to be there. Mark's a good guy. But yeah, so we've learned so much, you know, in the last five or six years about shoreland zoning. Um, you know, a lot, and a lot of it is because, you know, we wanted a couple projects we really wanted to get done. Like my family camp on Cobbacy was the, probably the hardest one. You know, that was it. Yeah. I had to get DOT permits for that. And it's stuff they don't teach you. 
you know, in high school or right. college, stuff you got to learn. And it's, it is, it's frustrating. Oh, so I frustrating. mean, there's no doubt about it, but it's all in yeah. place for a reason to help protect, you know, right. the environment and these bodies of water mm-hmm. that are so important to all of us that, you know, it, yeah, it, you've got to have patience and I, work with people who know what they're doing to. And education. You and know? education, exactly. The, the, big, the biggest thing is you, people don't think, oh, you can't, how they put those stairs on the water right there, how they cut down that tree. It's not, you can do a lot of things, but you have to go through the right processes. And you might have to, to to get from point A to point B. A lot of times they're not going to tell you what to do. You have to find the way to make it happen. You know, and if, if, a, if a tree or something, you know, you, want, you need to move that, there's other things you can do to mitigate that, you know. Blue, they love blueberry mm. bushes, right? High, yeah. high bush blueberry yeah. bushes. Or <laughs> p- people don't understand, like access to the water. You have a fundamental right to have safe a- access to the to water. You know, so I mean, we've seen right. beautiful granite stairs going right down the ocean. You know, people would go by and, I mean, really freak out, but they don't they don't know because it's education too. So, yep. the more we've mm-hmm. learned, the more we've been able to educate people and you know go through the process. Yeah. I just think it's so important that folks like you are like thinking through the things, you know, cause it really, our lakes are dependent on it. You know, like the, the folks are following those rules and they're, they're, they are totally a pain and sometimes they're more expensive, but they are, they're there so that we can all have these pristine bodies of water and it, it costs really more money to do it right. You know, it does cost more money. For we, sure. we have a project right now. I can't tell you too much cause it's an episode, <laughs> but it's pretty amazing. The lengths we've gone through, you know, to make it happen and to protect the water quality and, you know, the homeowners understand that doing it in the winter when everything's frozen is going to protect the lake more and it has a higher cost. But, you know, they, they love the lake just as much as anyone yeah. else. And, you know, so sometimes you've got to do the, the right thing if it costs more money to get there, but you can do it. Yeah. Yep. That being said, I'll give us a shameless plug. We do consulting for Shoreland Zoning and Permits. <laughs> so anyone out there, you know, send us a message and we'll take care of you. Not that we want to. It's just something That's that really good. <laughs> Well, Tyler, so again, where can people find more information about the Onion Foundation and apply for grants and work with this, you know, yeah. you, you all in your great organization? We have a beautiful website. It's at onionfoundation.org. You can see my little face and you can get my contact information there and all the information you need to know whether to help you decide if you are maybe a good candidate or not and save everybody a lot of time. <laughs> Perfect. That's our goal. That's always good. Um, and you can celebrate. You know, we have every previous grant we've made on there from the last six years. So oh, you cool. can celebrate all of the cool work that's going on around Maine and maybe learn about some new orgs and initiatives while you're there. Nice. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. And I, I have two um, very important oh, colleagues. Oh, yeah. They were so quiet. <laughs> They were one of them started snoring and one of them started barking and I I was back here snapping. We gotta know their names the before you go. One, yeah, this little one here is Taco. Oh, there he is. And the big one, yeah, and the big one is Bowie. Bowie. Here we go. Oh, there they Hi, go. guys. Perfect timing. <laughs> what a great end. Well, thank you very well, much. I really enjoyed this. Perfect. Yeah, it was really nice to chat with you guys. You as well. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Thanks, you too. Bye. And we are back with Project Pointers, brought to us by our friends at Benjamin Moore, the official paint and stain supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company. If you've got a question for us, submit a short video and photos or photos with your question to podcast at maincabmasters.com. As much detail as possible. Don't forget your name, and we will try and answer it as best as possible. Did Ashley do any Project Pointer questions? Yeah, we did. We did together. Man. Yeah, it was pretty good. She actually did. She actually helped a lot. She, she, your sister knows a lot. Oh, she, she's queen. Uh, your sister is the smartest person I think I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I, she is. <laughs> in a sense. No, I don't, not, not mess How many it. people have you met in your life? Hey, All right, let's go on to these Project great. Pointer questions. She's great. Maggie, it's a saying, but think about it. She's very savvy. She wanted to be a sure. savvy. She wanted to be a stay at home dog mom, and uh, damn it, she pulled it off. She is savvy. <laughs> and funny and beautiful. Anyways. And can pick out a Stop. good color. All right. You two. Chill. 
And it's your family. This one's from Susan Busier. Here's some pictures. Hi, Susan. Hey, Susan. So you could just come down the woodshed and ask us. <laughs> <laughs> but this is great. All right. Pass them out. Oof. Those don't look good. Don't make judgments until I read to you what it's about. My friend has a real log home built in 1951 from hemlock found on the property. She wants to fill the space between the logs and some of the horse hair is showing. Some of the log spacing is still nicely filled and she is wondering what the recommendation is. Well, she came to the right place because Chase Morrill is an expert at this. <laughs> I was actually um, milling up some hemlock at 6 o'clock this morning. For what? Um, some thresholds for Steve's house. Oh, wow. Finishing up. But I had a bunch of it left over, like drops from that, yeah, from one of the projects. So um, it does clean up nice. It really does. Do you think this is interior or exterior? Don't look. Interior. Don't look. I at think me. it's interior. I actually thought that was a um, wire for a minute, but that's just like, like a cord they put. Yeah, the chinkin, right? So it looks like what they originally used was some sort of gap filler, and then the hemp, I think, right? And then not some, the kind you smoke. Not the kind you smoke. Hemp fibers, juice. Oakum? Oakum. Yes. Oakum. Yeah, so if people don't know, when we our first um, foray into heat in the, t- uh, in the TV with the History Channel was Lost Cabin Hunters, where we went up to Nine Mile Bridge. Way up north. And fixed that. Yeah, we took an old cedar log cabin and replaced the chinking in it, and we made our own. We brought up some oakum and made our own. And it's nasty stuff, if people want to know. It was it like was pine tar. We were cooking it. Oh, we were cooking it in a kettle oh. over a burn barrel, and it it was like rope that like someone didn't know what they were making, but it's just because you have to you take the oakum and you pretty much just slather it up and you like yeah. I think it it's it really it's just like hemp strands or some sort of fibrous strands all together, and you just slather it up, slap it in. I mean, I'm sure there's probably cleaner ways to do it than what we were, but it it was pine tar, beeswax, and turpentine, I think, which is. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we the the Extremely one package of rubber gloves flammable. lasted like for the first two hours, and then it was like oh, our hands and. But it smelled delicious. I can smell my on my hands like. Yeah, oh yeah, all our clothes. And yeah. We were up there for two weeks, stinking of it. But nowadays they make a like a um, spray foam, spray foam or a styrofoam. You know, just oh yeah, it's a, it's a. It looks, it looks like candy, but yeah, so you stuck it, stuff it in there, and then it's. Yeah, it's almost it, like insulation. It's a rolled in a roll. Yeah, it's like a tiny little poom noodle type of insulation. Yep. And you can shove that in. And that basically is just a backer. And then they've got newer products that are actual chinking that will expand and contract. That go over that. And can stretch so that, you know, you fill in the big gaps with the styrofoam and then use the new product that, you know, and it's you can get it in different colors. I think some it's got a sandy grit to it and it adheres pretty well. Um, it's hard to tell what this stuff originally was coated with. Maybe some sort of putty, almost. Yeah. How it cracks up. That, it looks looks like it, that one. That looks like it had a harder surfer, surface. Yeah, it looks yeah, like yeah. You've got the corded stuff, the hemp, the horse hair, whatever it is, and then almost like plaster, kind of. Yeah. So I, I'd say there's there's spots where it's all pulling out, and maybe that is a wire just hidden behind. That does look like a wire. It looks just like a old wire. I don't know. So. You know, clean off the stuff that's loose. It's like it's like painting anything. You want to clean off anything that's loose, chipped, or cracking, um, and then fill in any big gaps with the styrofoam. And then, if you can, go over everything with that new product, mastic, some sort of elastic. And if we give you any advice, don't stop halfway because it, it's gonna crack. Just if you can, just keep going. If it's, if it looks good to a two feet away, just take the extra time because it's a way better insulation. And you could always do a skim coat over yep. if there's some already on there that you don't have to touch. Skim coat across the whole thing so it looks uniform right across the whole side of things. And again, YouTube. Everything everything it's everything like cool stuff like that. Like we can tell you <laughs> stuff, but there'll be some guy on there showing you how to do it too. Yeah. And there are a lot of different brands of the product. Um, a log home catalog. So a log home Adam. supply catalog would be a good place to source the material. Um, and again, there's a lot of different companies that supply that. So that's where I would start. That brought up a funny memory. I, I'm still thinking about that. Yeah. I think I still have some of that. <laughs> I definitely have the turpentine and beeswax. It's just a big vat. It's like a <laughs> witch's brew or something. It really was. It was. <laughs> We're lucky we didn't burn the place. Well, no, we kept the fire. Plenty. Oh, yeah. I mean, turpentine's extremely flammable. We kept it far enough away from the cabin because there would have been no putting that out if it had. 
Good times. Yeah. Thanks, well, Sue. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Okay. Next one is from Ed Smith. Here's the pictures. What can I do to repair the cement? It looks like it's really thick, but it's only three inches or so. Any help would be greatly appreciated. So, yeah, what Ed has here, he has a pad, and it has a frost wall on it. It looks like it has a maybe a frost wall and backfill with a three-inch concrete on top. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Um, I like hydraulic cement. You know, it forms like concrete, and they use it for fixing walls. Um, it's really viscous. You know, and, but the thing is, you, it, it's when it sets, you have about 60 seconds and it sets, but it'll fill up with awesome cracks like that. And it's really, really, really strong stuff. When I used to do fences, um, if we got a ledge, we drill in the ledge and you'd, rip, you'd put your pipe in, you'd, you'd pour that in, put your pipe in, it would set in no time. And you couldn't pull that out with an excavator. Would you power wash it first? You should, but I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. And wait till spring, right? Yeah. But that that almost looks like it's. Oh, that's a crack too, isn't it? Is that a? It's hard to tell if that was a cut, a relief cut. Yeah, but it's so thick. I don't. And they do make you know if you go up to like A. H. Harris, they make all kinds of really nice, you know, stuff in a in a tube, a caulking that for joints and stuff that will, will expand and con contract because a lot of concrete applications they do put those joints in for expansion. Right, right, right. So you don't want to take that away either. And do you think that do you think there's a height difference there? Yeah, I think that's frost, personally, don't you? The frost moved that. Yeah, but if you wanted to get rid of that uh, tripping hazard. you Yeah, you could use hydraulics, but again, or you could use. Almost like a self-leveler. Yep. And then you could also, you know, if you did that, you, you're, you're going to have a color, a discoloration, but you could always seal everything over on top of that. Because really. And you never see it. Your ultimate goal is to stop any more water or. Ice buildup going down in there because that's what's causing it to crack and separate. That looks like the expansion joint, and it actually might have cracked and water got in it. I think yeah. that's what happened. So if you can seal that up and, again, get it so it sheds water. Oh, that'd be the best crack in the world right there if that's not <laughs> – that's natural. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's a little too clean of a 90 degree. And that, that's the problem with concrete around here. It's like I've, I've done patios back in the day, you know, pavers, and I've come out and seen them like 18 inches. It moved all around like it was ruined. And if you do it right and do your base right, it'll go back. But with concrete, it breaks. It's not right, designed to right, do that. Right, right, right. But that, yeah, you can you can fix that. And if, like I said, I would I don't, I think that's expansion joint. So just fix that and be good to go. And if that doesn't go, wait till spring. Obviously, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Make sure. But same thing, frost. like you said, there's some products where you could fill in that yep. crack where it's going to expand, almost like the um, chinking for a log home. Yeah. It's got a sand mortar base to it, but it's got some expansion capabilities. Again, it's all about sealing out the water. It's funny how things come in clusters. It's kind of like the same question, but for two different applications. Yeah. Nice job, guys. Nice job, Maggie. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Is that it for Project Pointers? Yes. All right. Thank you again for submitting those. Keep them coming. And if you have more, send them to podcast at maincabmasters.com. And we are now on to fan questions. Indeed we are. All right. Are you ready? Sure. This one is from Karen Whited. We have a large number of native rocks from Alabama collected from the streams and woods. How can we sort them to build a fire pit or patio? What is the process? How can we what? Sort them. <laughs> I wanted to know the answer to this one. Well, did your dad, in an upcoming episode, fixes a fire pit and it came out wonderful. So. That episode just aired. I think that's why we got this question. No, nope, another one that's coming up, too. Yeah, this past summer there was a... You've done a couple. A, a, Chase, well, is yeah. an episode. Chase is an expert at these. There's a bunch of masonry projects. Yeah. So tell us, Chase, please. How do you sort them? Yeah. Put them in piles based on the size. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but what, what, you're supposed to... Biggest on bottom, right? New use mortar. Yeah. I think, again, the big thing is making sure... This is what my father always taught me. Making sure that it sheds the water. You don't want pockets with masonry, with outdoor. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm no mason, but uh, it runs in your family. I've seen a lot of interesting masonry work on the moral. Yes, places. but anywhere that if you're using odd shaped rocks, make it so that the water can't pull up on top, on top, 
that it will shed down and because that's where the water will seep down in and freeze and crack and s- separate the rocks. Well, think about Higgins Street. Did, is that your grandfather? Yeah. So that was that lasted a long time. It was pretty awesome. So he used to drive up to Clearwater. And do you know where um, Day's General Store is? Or, oh, no, yeah. sorry. Uh, Christie's. Yeah, yeah. Down there, there used to be a gravel pit. Because, I mean, it's all sand or sand pit, I guess. That's still there. And he would pick up. They'd have those smooth boulders. And so he'd grab like four or five every time he drove by. by. And he did a bunch of stonework. He, you know, the chimney up to Clearwater is all those yeah. rocks. Really? Yep. So he did a lot of stone. You know, down front, it's all stonework. And I think... One of the things that will help out, you'll probably attest this, if you can make a form to, to help, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. A little bit. And yeah, do a little at a time, build up, and I guess... And the thing about masonry, which is why I don't do it, is patience is big. You can only do it so much in a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, because all the weight and like it has to set up. Well, like the fireplace in my mother's place in North Wayne, that was rocks that my parents had collected. And then they faced the whole thing, but it was like different rocks from all over the country and, you know, just kind of make them work. And I think ended up putting some sort of sealant on them, a silicone, just, cause, you know, you do the masonry work and you want it to pop. So when you do the masonry work, make sure you get off as much as you can. It's like tiling, you know, you don't you want to get down to that film. So you just yeah. wash that off and then you seal it with like some sort of silicone sealant. So that seals out moisture, but it also makes the rocks kind of a little glossier. I just had a flashback. I think season two, I had this great. I found a like two cabins in a row. I found a really cool rock. I, don't know if, I was like, I'm gonna grab a cool rock from every cabin, <laughs> and I got like eight interesting rocks in a pile in front of the like my barn down back. Are they still there? Oh, they're still there. They're, they're not in a trench somewhere. No, no. I think maybe one or two of them. There. One's like a perfect square, and another one like yeah. Well, in that um, one of the episodes up in Greenville, that same thing. They had uh, done that fireplace there with all the different stones. Yeah, that guy. That was quite a story. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's possible. You just want to make sure. Again, I think shedding water is the big thing, and pick a show side. And it, I guess it all depends how big the rocks are, too. My father did a lot of stone work, and his philosophy was three drops, and then he wouldn't touch it again. So, you know, you, you move, you want them to get per- fit perfectly. Yeah. So the third time, it, it was just he stopped touching it. Really? Yeah. Whereas my Uncle Lay down at the Damascata <laughs> Mills fish ladder, I mean, that's all stone ponds. And Deep, that, too. And that's constant upkeep. And they use a, you know, cement. I don't know what, but it's a, it's a cement product, mortar product, that's meant to be submersed in water. So, again, it kind of depends on your application. And there are different products out there that work better than others. And people, once a mason likes what he likes, that's what he uses. Like, oh, yeah. Know, some people some people like, oh, it's four pots of pulling cement and some sand and then some gravel and this and that. Aunt Sharon will let us know on the YouTube. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I got our chin on the chat. Yeah. All right. That's all we have time for today. All for right. Questions. She's cutting us off for questions. Yeah. I am. And so now we're on to new products. We've got great t shirts and hats. The 207 is heaven. And a lot of times we wear these, people ask, what does it mean? 207 is Maine's area code. And so we've got these great screen printed 207, 207 is heaven t shirts. And hats. Our good friend Colin from Sugarloaf was the first person that um, introduced us to these. Yeah. Told us about them. And, yeah, they're great. And it's it's no lie, really. 207 is heaven. 207 is heaven. And we've got different size T-shirts and the um, trucker hats. And all kinds of other cool stuff. Yes. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even think two and two. Those are cool trucker hats. Yeah. Which you can find at shop.kennebeccabincompany.com. And now it's time. Did Ashley do a trivia question? Yes, we did. So I get two trivia questions today. Oh yeah, Ch- Chase can. Did you, he, you were right about the answer. The last one. What was it? It was the um, the the phone one. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Bryant Pond. Yeah. They've got that giant telephone there. And the coffin factory. All right. This one was. What is planted around Merry Meeting Bay to attract migrating waterfowl? What is planted around Merry Meeting Bay to attract waterfowl? Yeah. What are ducks like? What are duck, duck sauce? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet and sour sauce, chicken fingers? Rose hips? No. Ryan, do you know? Blueberries? 
Now, Ryan, do you know the answer? No, I was gonna say something wise. Cattails? No. What's planted around duck blinds? No. <laughs> Grass. No. Marijuana. Is it a food? Yes. Corn. Corn. No. Potatoes. Do you want to keep guessing? Oak trees. It's a food. <laughs> ho- ho- uh. <laughs> All right, Wait. I'm gonna tell you. Squash. Give us a, give us another. Um, it's fiddleheads. No, it's it's a grain. It's like a Mary Mead wheat. Bay. No. Bean and baked beans. No. It's a grain. Barley. No. Rye. No. It's, it's a like couscous. No, it's oh, like I love the couscous. most eaten grain ever. <laughs> oh, rice. Rice. Wild rice. Oh. Rice. <laughs> oh my god, you could, that was a bad one. All right, it was fun, we though. obviously didn't know it. <laughs> what was my thing? I wouldn't even know what wild rice looked like. Me either. Me either. I thought right. No. no. Well, if you know the answer, or if you knew the answer, congratulations. Because yeah. we, because <laughs> we did definitely not. did not. <laughs> and whoever was the first person to send that answer to podcast at maincatmatch.com wins a great prize. Yeah. All right. So do you think it's different than wild rice that you buy? Yes. Oh, I got a question for you guys. I googled it, and that's all that came up. What is the official mascot's name of this Olympics? Um, Bing Dwendwen. Yes! Oh my wow. God, she's so smart. <laughs> you nailed it. I didn't know that. Look at me. Okay. Are you ready? Should have known she would have got it. Who was the first artist to receive President John F. Kennedy's Freedom Medal? Gotta be, gotta be a Maine. Huh? They are. No, they're from. Yes, they're from Maine. Well, there's been a lot of great ones. I think I know who it is. Well, no, I don't. Okay, well, don't say it. I won't say it. Is it it art or poetry? Art. Is poetry art? Sometimes it's all art. art. It's all art. We should ask ask Tyler. Yeah, where's Tyler? All right. All right. Cool. Yeah. Well, good to have you guys back, man. (laughs) (laughs) Felt felt like it's been years. (laughs) And thank you again to Ashley for helping out last week. Thank you to everybody for tuning and listening and keep those questions coming. Thank you to our sponsors, Nelma Hero Media Network. Hammond Lumber Company, Kennebec Savings Bank. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Maggie. And from the woodshed, we'll be talking to you. From the woodshed has been brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp? Trust the quality. Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. From the Woodshed is a production of Kennebec Cabin Company. See you next time.